أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاه والسلام على سيد الانبياء وخاتم المرسلين والشفيع المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين اذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللانه الدائمه الباقي لاعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم وغاصب حقوقهم من الان الى قيام يوم الدين اما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم ان الله اصطفى ادم ونوحا وعلى ابراهيم وعلى عمران على العالمين صلوات عليك <تصفيق> comes again with its blessings it comes with that special emotional attachment that we have with imam hussain alayhi salam that we are able to gather in various places whether it's in masajid and imam bargahs or in other centers or some in some places they don't have any facility they gather in the houses of the mu'minin but the emotional le- level that we have as far as our attachment to karbala is concerned that makes it easy for us to reflect on the message of karbala and that is why you will see that you know when it comes to the mass education process that we have in the shi history there is nothing which can be compared to the aza of sayyid shuhada alayhi salatu wassalam <clears throat> during this majalis for this ashara the theme that i was selected is the issue of family life in islam from the perspective of the quran and the ahlul bayt and the focus would be on the ayat of quran and the examples from the prophet and the imams so that we can relate to the guidelines that they have given to us quran is the constitution for us and ali muhammad are the practical embodiment of the quran for us so you have the teachings on one hand and the uswa hasana role models on the other hand and that is why rasulullah mentioned in nitarikum fikum as-saqalain i'm leaving two things the quran and my family as i'd mentioned in these few talks that we had that the theme of family life in islam is very much in line with the concept of shia islam because this is a mazhab which is based on this issue of family uh, from the she perspective especially when we talk about the family of the prophet let me mention one more ayat for tonight and later on we'll go into details of that that even if you look at one of the famous ayat of quran which is which talks about the basic concept of shiism is the ayat known as aya mawaddat where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the muslims that in return for the hard work of rasulullah you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al mawaddata fi al qurba i ask only for one thing that you love my family so the family again is there part of our concept of the shi'i islamic theology interestingly in tonight's talk you know this concept of mawadda we will look at it at two different levels on the level of aqida when it comes to ali muhammad and in on the level of our own family life 
where this term has been used at both levels. Of course, at a different level of uh, you know, emphasis, but the, the term mawadda has come on, on, on the both level. I talked about this concept of sukoon, peace and tranquility in human life. In the very first majlis where we said, according to Quran, there are three bases of sukoon, peace and tranquility. One was zaman, and then makan, and then makin. Time factor, space, and spouse. We talked about makan, as far as the system of you know, family life in, in Islam is concerned, whether we have you know, joint family system or separate family system, or something in between, which Islam prefers, combining the good of both and eliminating the negativity from both systems. We also emphasize on the point of taking care of old parents. And last night, I wanted to emphasize on two points, that when we talk about family life, you know, we can deal with each problem when it comes along the way. But if you have these two fundamental bases of family life in Islam, all other problems would be resolved very easily. One was the unity of purpose in life. If members of the family are all united, they know why we are in this dunya, what is our ultimate destination. If the destination is same, and the path that they have to choose to reach there is same, then there will be harmony within the family. That is one basis of, you know, and then you will see all other problems will become secondary. And the other was the concept of Amra bil Maruf and Nahil Munkar, which is not only for the community and the society, you know, out there. It is there, it begins from the household, where the husband and the wife, brothers and sisters, parents and children, you know, everyone gets together to help one another in acquiring ma'roof and from keeping away from what is known as munkar. Salawat wa akbar. Tonight we'll begin the discussion about makin, third of the three bases of peace. No more about household, whether you have same or separate. You know, well, now we'll talk about individuals and we'll start with the basic. And that is the issue of husband and wife. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about marriage, he mentions marriage as one of the three bases of sukoon in human life. In Surah Rum, the ayat is very famous where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, enlisting his signs of his power and glory, he says, Wa min ayatihi. One of the signs of his power and glory. And خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا That he has created spouses from you, for you from your own selves. Not from jinnat and here and there. All human beings. Azwaj doesn't mean wives. It means spouses. It applies to both genders. The term zawj in Arabic is used for both. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that one of the signs of my power and glory is that I have created this institution of marriage where a man and a woman get, you know, related to one another by the process of marriage. Why has he established this relationship of marriage? لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you get sukoon, peace and tranquility in your life through the relationship of marriage. And so we see marriage has been described in the Quran as one of the bases of, um, you know, peace and tranquility. Even if you look at one of the surveys which came out, I think this year, uh, especially referring one of the famous uh, psychologists of your country, where he it says it's not money which is at the top of the list which brings peace in life of a human being. It is interesting that they highlighted marriage to be the number one factor in peace, you know, and happiness in the lives of the people compared to money. Salawat Pranayak Parar.
the irony is that we look at those data, new findings, and then we say, oh, it's there in the Quran. But the Quran was with you before that also. Why didn't you go to Quran before? That is our problem. You know, this is where we have to realize that we have to take this as the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe in it and let the, the world, you know, reach to Quran later on. You can say we were already, already there where you have reached now after 1400 years. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sukun, he says, لِتَسْكُنُ إِلَيْهَا That I created this institution of marriage so that you may get sukun. Now he doesn't stop at that. The ayat continues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have created two elements within you in marriage, which will become the bases or the pillars of peace and tranquility. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I created among you in marriage between husband and wife the elements and the emotions of mawaddat and rahmat. Love and compassion or love and mercy. Now when you look at this, you know, our earlier mufassireen, if you study the works of the scholars before, they were probably looking at these two elements according to the framework of their own societies. And they would say that, well, Allah created this element of mawaddat as law and rahmat as mercy. So mawaddat was placed in the heart of the wife towards the husband and the mercy was put in the heart of the husband towards the wife. You would say, subhanallah, but when I look at the modern lifestyle, I think we have to reverse that. <laughs> Things have changed. But in reality, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have placed bainakum, <coughs> between you, muwadda and rahma, both elements have gone into the hearts of both spouses here. So the element of mawaddat and rahma is there in the heart of the husband as well as in the heart of the wife. Salawat from the Iqbal. This promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is universal. It doesn't only apply to Muslims. Wherever there is a marriage, of course, marriage between a man and a woman, not the other way. Because that's not acceptable from the Quranic point of view. What is considered to be the proper marriage, if it has happened, it happens in any religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will send down mawadda and rahmah to that couple. And the dalil I have is, for example, you have a Hindu married couple. And they have children. Later on, they see the light. They become Muslim. They become Shia. They come here. You make them recite the Shahadatain. After that, do you say to them, now we have to sit down and recite your Nikah? Have you heard this before? No. They are husband and, you know, husband and wife in the previous religion of idol worshipping, Hinduism. They convert to Islam. They become Muslim. We recognize their marriage in the previous religion. There is no renewal of nikah for them. Not only that, even their children, we consider them to be legitimate because they were born according to the marriage laws of the religion that they followed before. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, I place mawadda and rahma, this promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes to the human beings in general. It's not confined to one religion. But the question that I have here is just these two elements which I consider to be the fundamental pillars of a successful marriage, which brings about peace and tranquility in life, they are there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in every marriage I ja'ala, ja'ala means I place. 
or I create, or I make. Mawadda and rahma between you in marriage. It is there. But it is not something that you can, it's not a solid item that you can buy and then keep it there. These are psychological, you know, feelings and emotions that Allah creates. And that is why he says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ The way Allah, you know, interacts with us in our emotions and psychological level. And therefore he says, you know, in this process, these are signs of reflection for the people who have, who have aql. And so when these elements are created between the husband and wife in the process of marriage, the question is that, are these two elements going to last? And this is where we have to think about it. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates mawadda and rahma. But he says, this is not a solid item which will stay with you just like that. You have to work on it. You will have to nurture it. You will have to strengthen it. You will have to protect it so that it stays with you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially says, yes, ja'ala. He creates, creates these elements of mawadda and rahmah which are the basis of sukoon in marriage life. But he says, don't think that this is the end of the story. This is just the beginning of the story. I have given you something, you have to cherish that. You have to hold on it. You have to protect it, and you have to let it grow by your own behavior towards one another. Salawat from the Akbar. You hear this saying, match made in heaven. Even in Urdu we say, kya? Rishte jo hai asman mein bane. To an extent, yes, it's made over there. But its survival doesn't depend on the heaven. It, that depends on you. It could be made over there. But when it comes to the reality, whether it will survive, you will be able to have that sukoon or not at the end, that totally depends on you. We have to realize that, you know, when we look at our tradition, and I'll just give you some examples, that the survival of a marriage and the sukoon that we seek for in this institution is totally dependent on the husband and wife in their akhlaq and behavior towards one another. The ingredients of mawadda and rahma is there, but it has to be nurtured, it has to grow, and that is in your hand. Many times we look at the issue of istikhara. You know, for marriage it's very common. People say, oh, istikhara dekhen pehle. And I, I see, there's no problem. I don't have a problem with istikhara. Although it will make my life very easy. Especially with those who are obsessed with istikhara. You know, when it comes to istikhara, let me mention two things. Number one, there is a saying in our you know, literature where it says, al-istikhara ba'd al-istishara. Which means that you don't make decision initially on the basis of istikhara. Whenever an issue comes to you in your life, look at it, study yourself. See what are the good you know, and bad you know, impact if you do it. And then come to a decision. If you are not able to make the decision, then do istishara. Istishara means go and consult those who know. You want to buy a car, you're confused, this one or that one, go and ask somebody who knows about it. It's a legal issue, you don't know much about it, go and ask a lawyer. If you're a serious, you know, medical issue, which cannot be solved by on-counter, you know, medication, then you go to the doctor. So this is a stashara, you go and ask those who know. If after that also you get two opinions, Experts also, you know, differ on that. You are still confused. Then one option, it's not a wajib. One option is istikhara. You don't have to do it, but if you want to do it, you can do it. 
Even in marriage, there is nothing in our Sharia which says that it is sunnat or mustahab to, so, to look istikhara in marriage. You have to check the background of the family, of the person. You know, once you see things are okay, that's the end of the story. But if you go for istikhara, I'm not saying there is anything wrong with it. But the problem is when people take istikhara as a guarantee that everything will be okay till the end of life. Because many times I see, you know, when divorce cases come, one of the things they say, oh, Murana, like an istikhara dekh liya tha. Who told you istikhara is a guarantee? Even if the mesh was made in heaven, there is no guarantee it will last. Because mawadda and rahmah is placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hearts of the newlywed couple, but they have to work on it. Survival depends on themselves. Istikhara is not a guarantee. And sometimes it becomes so ironic when they say, Maulana, aapi ne to istikhara dekha tha. When a divorce comes, case comes to me, where they say, you saw istikhara. So don't blame me. Don't blame me. Don't blame the ayat of Quran. The relationship was good. And when the nikah happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the, all, the elements of mawadda and rahmah in your hearts. You didn't cherish that. You didn't let it grow. He did not protect it. So there is no guarantee it is in your hand. So remember that, yes, mawadda and rahmah is there as the foundation of a peaceful marriage where you can have sukoon and peace and tranquility, but you have to work on it. Salawat on Let us go to the seerah of the Prophet on this issue. Can there be a better matchmaker than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Nobody is going to challenge that statement. You know, if he is bringing two people in marriage, you know, what else do you want? This is not istikhara, this is Rasulullah. And what happened? You know, after his marriage to Bibi Khadija, Bibi Khadija was a very affluent lady of Mecca. And right in the early days, she had a slave who was very uh, good mannered and efficient in his work. She basically gifted that slave by the name of Zaid bin Harissa to Rasulullah. And she says, he is now your slave in your service. He will be there with you doing all your you know, work. Although Zaid bin Harissa was gifted by Bibi Khadija to our Prophet as a personal servant, you know, but the akhlaq of Rasulullah was such that this master-slave relationship very soon changed into father-son relationship. He was so much impressed with the akhlaq of Rasulullah that he now, you know, it became more like a father-son relationship. And remember, you know, those days slavery was not like what you hear in your own past history of America. It wasn't like, you know, Uncle Tom's cabin. That's a different version and, and you know, vision of slavery compared to what existed in that part of the world those days. Because in Islam, even those days when slavery was allowed, a slave was considered to be part of the family members. If you look at the list of people who are your dependent, where it is wajib for you to take care of them and maintain them, you will see at the end you have the slave. Even in the laws of inheritance, you will see if a person dies and has nobody from his family members who would inherit him, then the slave becomes the waris of the master. And so, you know, it was a very different kind. It wasn't like, you know, the Uncle Tom's, uh, Uncle, uh, Uncle Tom's uh, cabin situation here. And so, this was the relationship, and this reflects the akhlaq of Rasulullah. That even when he dealt with somebody who was 
you know, officially and legally a slave, his akhlaq was so good that it turned into a fa like a father-son relationship. Now, Zaid was not a slave by birth. His family was traveling somewhere in, in Arabia. You know, these gangs of robbers came and looted them, and one of the things they got hold on to was this young boy by the name of Zaid. He eventually ended up into the slave market, and at the end, you know, he ended up in the household of Bibi Khadija as one of her slaves. And then she gifted him to the uh, prophet. The father of Zaid, Haris, Haris, who came from southern part of Arabia, was always looking for his son. He got the news that his son is a slave of someone by the name of Muhammad in Mecca. <coughs> he comes all the way to Mecca, inquired about the Prophet, they told him this is Muhammad, this is before Islam. And you know, he came to Rasulullah, he said, you know, you have a slave who is my son. And I would like to buy him from you. Rasulullah said, if you are the father, and this is what has happened, take him, he's free. There's no issue of buying him. I free him. You can take him. Zaid was called. He met the father. And you can realize emotionally what kind of a you know, a meeting would have been of the father and the son. At the end, the father says, oh, my son, you are free now. Let's go back home. And this is where you see the akhlaq of Rasulullah coming out. Zaid refuses to go with his real father. He says, although my master has made me free, I am a free man now. But by my own choice, I prefer to stay with him and not with my father. Because of the akhlaq of Rasulullah that he had seen. The father became very angry. He basically did what we sometimes hear the terms, you know, aq and this and that. You know, disowned him that you are no more my son. And Rasulullah stood up in presence of the people there in the market in Mecca. He says... O oh, people, know that from now on I have adopted Zaid bin Harissa. He is now my son. And from that day he was known as Zaid bin Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <laughs> of course, after Hijrat, you know, different rules came in and the legal implication of Adaption was abolished in Islam. You could still take care of the orphans, you know, just like your own children, but you cannot give your name to them. And therefore, Zaid bin Muhammad became again Zaid bin Harissa, like before. But now he was a free person, a very close companion of Rasulullah, and among the early ones who had accepted the da'wat of Islam from Rasulullah. And in Medina, Rasulullah decided to get him married. This is where I'm talking about the Prophet as the matchmaker. Zaid came from apparently a big background of slavery. So among the Arabs, you know, it was not really a good status. Quraysh and Banu Hashim were at the top of the social hierarchy there. Rasulullah wanted to abolish this you know, discrimination among the people. And he decided to get, you know, Zaid married to his own cousin by the name of Zainab bin Tejahash, who is from Banu Hashim. And the marriage took place. This is the only marriage of a Sahabi, and only Sahabi mentioned by name in the Quran, Zaid. His name is there, actually. He's the only Sahabi of Rasulullah who has been mentioned in Surah Ahzab, ayat number 37. <coughs> but what happens? And this is my point. Rasulullah, in a way, trained Zaid bin Harissa. He is so much impressed by the akhlaq of Rasulullah, acquires that sirat. And then you have the cousin of Rasulullah by the name of Zainab bin Tajahash. 
Again, a good woman. Rasulullah is the matchmaker. They get married, but what happened at the end? The marriage didn't last. They could not, you know, maintain the respect for one another. Eventually, it ended in divorce, and that is what also mentioned in Surah Azab about it. And so the, the point is that you can have a matchmaker like Rasulullah, but there is no guarantee. He wouldn't give you a certificate that, well, you know, you will survive in your marriage with sukoon and peace and tranquility because that is from yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create the elements of mubadda and rahma in your hearts. But you will have to work on it. And the way you will work on it is about, you know, your own elements of akhlaq and the behavior that you have towards one another. Salawat barana Two, exa- two words have been used, mawadda and rahma, or mawaddat and rahmat. Let us focus on the first one today, and inshallah we'll talk about rahmat tomorrow night. When we look at the word mawaddat, or the Arabic way of saying it, mawadda, you know, this, this is, many times people say, well, this is just like muhabbat. Yes, they're very close. But there is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't use the word muhabbat in marriage context here. He uses the term muwaddat. Because when you look at it, muhabbat, what we call normally love. This is actually the, the love of the appearance of things, of the zahir. The beauty of the person. The status of the person the social background of this person, the wealth of the person. And if that is the only basis of relationship, that love and muhabbat will fade away when those things change. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want to base marriage relationship on something which can fade away. It has to be based on something more profound. And that is where the word mawaddat comes in. Mawaddat basically is the love for the beauty of the character of the person. Not the zahir of the person. Rather the batin and the character of the person. And that is the, the main difference. And what are the implications of that? Muhabbat is only something, you know, you appreciate the beauty of it. Or you see something good in something or someone, you say, you know, in a way you like it. Whereas mawaddat is beyond that. Yes, you love and like that person. But mawaddat demands that you have the willingness to mold yourself according to the like and dislike of the other. This flexibility. Because there are two individuals who are from different backgrounds joining in this relationship where they are going to become partners of life for a long time. And that cannot happen unless there is a flexibility on both sides in order to mold themselves according to the like and dislike of the other. And that is where you will get peace and tranquility. Salawat And now we will understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about our relationship to Ali Muhammad, doesn't use the term muhabbat. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةِ O Muhammad, say to your followers that I ask for nothing in return for my hard work, no reward except one. Al-Mawaddata fil Qurba, that you should have Mawaddat towards my family. The reason 
is that, yes, we do not deny the concept of muhabbat of Ali Muhammad. But as Shias, we have to reach the level of the muwaddat of Ali Muhammad. And the difference is that muhabbat only means that you appreciate the virtue and the fazilat in the other. But there is a difference between Shia and somebody who just appreciates. If you look at the fazail of Amir al-Mu'mineen, in a more than seven decades, his image was being tarnished in every Friday khutbah. But at the end, it emerges as a personality who is loved in the meaning of muhabbat by non-Shias and non-Muslims also. You had an entire sect in the Sunni world by the name of Mu'tazili Muslims. Now they're all Ash'ari in their belief system, not in fiqh. In their aqidah, they are all Ash'ari. And there was a school before it, known as Mu'tazila, which vanished after the third century of the Islamic era. And the, one of the fundamental belief of the Mu'tazili Muslims was that after Rasulullah, the afwal, the most best of the ummah was Amir al-Mu'minin Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. But they were Sunni. So you ask them, you know, how come it doesn't go into our minds? If you believe in Ali to be the best after Rasulullah, how come he's still the fourth Khalifa? So they came up with this, you know, uh, their own intellectual way of explaining it. They say, you know, to prefer a maf mafzul over afzal is not something, you know, bad. Who told you that to become Khalifa you have to be the best? So their standards change. They said, yes, Ali was afzal, but we can make somebody else who is not afzal still be the Khalifa of the time. But the point here that I have is that they had that appreciation and kind of a love for the fadail of Amir al muminin Not only them, if you look at the Sufis, it's the same thing. If you look at the non-Muslims, especially those who come from, who are familiar with Muslim history and culture, whether it's in India or you look at Lebanon where they are Christians, Khalil Gibran Khalil, you know, he, he was a Christian. And it's amazing, he has a statement in when he wrote a preface to a book of another Lebanese writer about Amir al-Mu'mineen. There he says, he complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, well, Allah, if you wanted to create a human being like Ali, why, didn't, why did you send him at that time when the society did not appreciate him? Because we, in the 20th century, we need him now. What is the difference between him and us? What is the difference between the Mu'tazila Sunni and the Shia of Ali Muhammad? The difference is between Muhabbat and Mawaddat. They look at the Fazail of Ali Muhammad, appreciate the Fazail and virtues and qualities of Ali Muhammad, agree with that to the extent that they even have this kind of a low and appreciation for it. But they don't have the commitment to base their lives on the teachings and examples of Ali Muhammad. That commitment of living according to their teachings, according to their like and dislike, that is the reflection of Muwaddat. And that is the difference between those who just have the Muhabbat of Ali and those who have the Mawaddat of Ali. Salawat Quran Iqbal. Salawat Quran Iqbal. You know, these days in many programs here, especially in New, New Jersey, is known for it. You know, Ali Day and Hussein Day and this and that. You get all this non-Muslim professors coming and talking, glorifying words about our Imams. But it's only for our seminars, or for their lectures, or for their books. Not for their lives. 
And we have to understand the difference between them and us. That we are not like them. We have moved to the level of mawaddat, where we commit based on this ayat of Quran that our life will be based on the like and dislike of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad salawatullah alayhi Let me now move from that level of theology and aqidah to the level of amal in our own life. That mawaddat and look at the mawaddat in marriage. And so the demand of mawaddat between a husband and wife is that there should be a willingness on both sides to accommodate the likes and dislikes. The problem is, you know, in our culture, the expectation is that it is the wife who has to change totally and follow the like and dislike of the husband. From the Islamic perspective, it has to be both sides. Because both of them would still have their individuality. You cannot you know, destroy that. But there has to be a middle ground where they can coexist. And when they have that respect for one another and they have this flexibility, that is where sukoon and itmi'inan and peace and tranquility will come in life. So the problem is that we live in the era of human history where, you know, everything is self-centered. Selfishness is one of the hallmarks of the modern society. This problem of me. You know, when I was in Vancouver in the 80s, and we got into this tradition of, you know, being asked to talk during marriage ceremonies, I used to always end with advice, which I even do now. That before the nikah is recited, the bride and the groom have absolute right to think in the American way of me, my, and mine. This problem of me, me, me. As soon as ankahtu and qabiltu are uttered, in your mind, change that M upside down. That M becomes we. It's no more me now. If you think about it that way, then you will see peace and tranquility will come. Mawadda and rahma comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will be able to maintain it and build on it by this thinking of I am not alone now. Whatever I do has an impact on the life of the other. And that is something we have to see. The pr problem is even on the social level, political level, local and international, the whole mood of the world is to think about themselves. This problem of you know, rights on one side and the duties on the other side has been forgotten. Everybody talks about rights. Human rights, women's rights, children's rights, this rights, that rights. Nobody talks about the duties. America goes thousands of miles away from the shores of America into the small confine of Persian Gulf and they say we want to protect our rights, our interests. But those who live there, right there, they are not allowed to think about their own interest. You know, think about it. On a political level, international level, that's the mode of thinking. But, but you are so mal, you know, thousands of miles away from your own shores. You have a right to think about your interest here. And those who live right there are not allowed to think about their own survival. And then you look at family life. Because I deal with family issues and, you know, divorce cases, you will see both parties, they just say, oh, mera haq. my right, my right. Why don't you think about your duties? In Islam, when you look at the issue of haq, the rights, the first clear definition of that comes from none other than Amirul Mu'minin Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. <coughs> And 
And he uttered these words in a khutbah at a time and in circumstances which were really, I would consider it to be a miracle by itself. He was not giving an address to a university or law school or a political science, you know, association. He was not giving this khutbah in Medina or Kufa. He gave this khutbah on this such an important issue of human society about rights of the rulers and the citizens in Safin at the time of the battle. Of course, not at that time, the battle was not going on. But he sees the moment even there to talk about this such an important issue where he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a right on you as your wali and ruler. But then immediately he says, وَلَكُمْ عَلَيَّ مِنَ الْحَقِّ مثل الذي لي عليكم. He says, rights can never exist on one side. It has to be reciprocal, it has to be mutual. He says, Allah has made me a ruler over you, and therefore I have a right over you. But immediately he says, even you have a right over me. And then he goes into detail about this issue at the end, he says, لا يجري لأحد إلا جرى عليه. He says, you know, this issue of حق and rights. It has a very beautiful description, but it's very difficult when it comes to implementation. And he says, لا يجري لأحد إلا جرى عليه. It can never come in benefit of one against unless it also comes against him. ولا يجري عليه إلا Jara lahu. And it cannot be against him, but also that it will be in his favor. What he is saying is that rights is one side and the duties are the other, is the other side of the coin. People only look at one side. They look at haq. They forget the farz. And when you look at the family life, if this starts to happen, if the couples just think about their own right, you know, this is my haq. They don't think about their duties. That is where facade and difficulties will start in life. Salawat para. Marriage cannot survive on the basis of the book of law or the book of rights. You might say, you know, who is this? With Abba Qaba sitting on the member and saying, you know, the book of law. Yes, I would say, life will not survive if the husband and wife just go by the masail and the rulings which are there in Tawzul Masail. They are there for a reason. But family life will survive. Sukoon and peace and tranquility will come if the element of mawadda and rahma are included in that decision making. That means that both parties will have to be flexible in exercising their rights and their haqq. If they just want to go by the book and say, oh, this is my right, things will not work. And I'll just give you a scenario. Legally, and all of, all of you know about it, Husband is the head of the family, and the wife is the, you know, assistant. Let's put it that way. Wife's head of the family. The husband has the duty to provide for the family. The wife has the duty of not refusing her husband. Husband has the right, has the duty to be kind to her. And the wife has the duty of not leaving the house without the consent or the permission of the husband. It is there. There is no issue in the, in the fatawa. It's, it's unanimously in the Shia fiqh. It's accepted. So you look at the book of the laws and, you know, the husband one day says to the wife that I exercise my right as the head of the family and I forbid you to leave the house. Is he doing something haram? 
According to the Sharia law, he's, he has the right to do that. But on a practical level, what happens? The wife can open the same Tawzihul Masail, and mashallah, these days they know about the Masail. <laughs> Gone are the days where the women were kept in, in dark. You bring Tawzihul Masail and you say, oh, this is my right. I forbid you to leave the house without my permission. She will open the next page. And what will she say to you? She will say, yes. Oh my, you know, Sartaj and Majazi Khuda, whatever you think about yourself. I ac accepted it. And the same Sharia which has given you this right also says that I don't have the duty of doing anything for you or your children in your home. No cooking, no laundering, no cleaning the house, taking care of the children, nothing. From the Sharia point of view, both of them are right. But do you think the, the life will go on? He is insisting on his right, she is now bringing her right. And there is a collision now. And this is where I'm saying life doesn't go by the book of law. The element of muhabbat or mawaddat and rahma has to be infused in the marriage relationship. Salawat upon the If people just live according to their rights and the book of law, they don't need to wait for akhirah to live the life of Jahannam. They'll get a test of it right here. And so think about it. The way to move beyond this issue of, you know, mera haq, you know, peace and tranquility doesn't come with that. It comes with this feeling of mawadda and rahma towards one another. Salawat <laughs> Shadi ki bunyad sir muhabbat pe nahi hai. Muhabbat ki jo baat hoti hai usme yahan ke jawan nasl kya kehti hai? They fall in love and fall out of love. Us us shadi ki haqiqat hi kya hai? Baat us love ki nahi hai. Baat मवद्दत की है अगर मवद्दत का जज्बा हो जो खुदावंद आलम हर शादी में पैदा करता है तो उसके साथ-साथ आपको सुकून जिंदगी में मिलेगा और इस सिलसिले में शरीयत की किताब से सिर्फ आप अपनी जिंदगी को नहीं चला सकते शरीयत के احکام کے ساتھ ساتھ اسلامی اخلاق کو بھی اپنانا ہوگا بلکہ ہمارے عرفاء کی زبان میں ہم تھوڑا اس کو چینج کریں گے کہ شریعت کے ساتھ ساتھ طریقت کو بھی لے کے چلنا ہوگا تب جا کے آپ کہیں حقیقت تک پہنچیں گے جب تک شریعت اور اخلاق ساتھ نہ ہو تو صرف شریعت احکام کو نہیں دیکھنا ہے اب آپ دیکھیں مثلا خداوند عالم نے جو فطرت سے کام لیا ہے I could have gone into English, but you know how to recite in Urdu also. Those who don't understand, they can, they can ask their friends later on to translate this part of it. When family life is talking about it, it is a belief that the law has given the husband to the husband. There is no two ways in it. We don't have to be apologetic for that. اس لیے کہ یہ بہت ہی معقول بات ہے معاشرے میں جہاں بھی ایک سے زیادہ انسان ہوتے ہیں چاہے وہ گروپ دو آدمی کو ہو یا دس آدمی کو کی ہو یا ہزاروں کی ہو ایک لیڈر ہونا چاہیے تاکہ معاملات میں ڈیسیشن لینے میں اس کی ذمہ داری ہوتی ہے ہی از ریسپانسبل اینڈ ہی از اکاؤنٹیبل اس لحاظ سے شوہر کو یہ مرتبہ دیا گیا ہے لیکن ساتھ ساتھ بی بی سے کہا جا رہا ہے کہ یہ تمہارا فرض نہیں ہے کہ شوہر کی خدمت کرو یا بچوں کی خدمت کرو 
घर की सफाई करो खाना पकाओ या लॉन्ड्री करो यहाँ तक कि शरीयत ने कहा है कि अगर एक माँ खुद अपने बच्चे को अगर वो फीडिंग कर रही है दो साल तक अगर वो चाहे अगर वो चाहे तो अपने शोहर से उसके लिए उजरत मांग सकती है कानून है लेकिन इस पर अमल कभी नहीं हुआ है और इन कभी नहीं होगा और होना भी नहीं चाहिए यही है हम जो हक की बात कर रहे थे ना कि सिर्फ कानून के किताब से जिंदगी नहीं चलती है लेकिन कानून की किताब में ये लिखा हुआ है अगर वो चाहे तो वो अपने शौहर से अपने ही बतन से पैदा किए हुए बच्चे को दूध पिलाने की आजर जो है मांग सकती है क्यों क्यों कानून में ये है ये इसलिए है कि शौहर को सरपरस्त तो बनाया गया है लेकिन खदशा था कि ये सरपरस्त साहब जो हैं बीवी को नौकर न समझे अपना गुलाम न समझे बावर्ची न समझे धोबन न समझे अपने कनीज न समझे उस तकबर और गुरूर को तोड़ने के लिए एक तरह सरपरस्त को सरपरस्त बनाया गया है लेकिन बीवी को इन तमाम जिम्मेदारियों से आज़ाद कर दिया गया है कानून की किताब में लेकिन खुदा वंद आलम ने फितरत में औरत के वो जज्बे मोहब्बत पैदा किया है कि कानून में इन बातों का जिक्र नहीं है फ़र्ज़ के ऊनवान से लेकिन खुदा ने वो जज्बा पैदा किया है कि वो अपने मोहब्बत की खातिर शौहर की भी खिदमत करती है बच्चों की भी खिदमत करती है शौहर का साथ देती है अपने घर के निगहदाश्त में सलाबाद पढ़ने एक बार लेकिन वो करेगी मोहब्बत की बुनियाद पर ज़बरदस्ती की बुनियाद पर नहीं है इस हैसियत से नहीं है कि वो नौकरानी है वो तो इसी तरह से खुदावंद आलम ने एक बैलेंस करार दिया है इस रिलेशनशिप में कि आप ज़बरदस्ती नहीं कराएंगे लेकिन वहाँ मोहब्बत की बुनियाद पर यह काम जो है ऑटोमेटिकली होता हो जाएगा इस सिलसिले में और हम आ, आपके सामने कुछ बातें पेश करेंगे लेकिन यहाँ पर सिर्फ एक मिसाल पर हम ख़त्म ख़त्म करना चाहेंगे कि जहाँ औरत अपनी जो कुर्बानी देती है उसके मंजलत को भी औलाद की नज़र में खुदावंद आलम ने शोहर से बढ़ा दिया है रसूल के सामने जब एक बंदा आया कि किसके साथ नेकी करें रसूल ने फरमाया वालदा फिर उसने रिपीट किया दोबारा माँ का जिक्र आया थर्ड टाइम पूछा फिर माँ का जिक्र चौथी बार जो है रसोल्ला ने बाप का जिक्र किया यही जो कहा जाता है कि जन्नत जो है माँ के कदमों के नीचे है ये फ्री नहीं मिलती है उन्हें ये जज्बे ये मोहब्बत की बुनियाद पर जो कुर्बानियाँ देती हैं माँ जो अपने शरीक हयात के मसाइल में शरीक बनती हैं उनका ये अजर होता है उनका ये मरतबा होता है बल्कि एक साहब ने बहुत अच्छा ये तबसरा किया था कि भाई रसुल्ला ने जो गोल्ड सिल्वर और ब्रॉन्ज तो माँ को दे दिया बाप को सिर्फ कंसोलेशन प्राइज मिल गया तो तीन तो वहाँ चला गया एक यहाँ मिला और वो इसलिए है कि वो फितरत और मोहब्बत की बुनियाद पर जब वो काम करती है तो वो जज्बे मोहब्बत है जज्बे रहमत है एक दूसरे के साथ और वहीं पे सुकून मिलेगा और उसी में हम देखेंगे कि हमारे मबदत अहल बैत का जज्बा भी कवि से कवि तर होता चला जाएगा सलाबाद पढ़ने एक बार और एक मिसाल करबला के हवाले से हम देना चाहेंगे कि जहाँ हसबैंड एंड वाइफ के जहन में और उनके तस्वूर में जो हम आहंगी हारमनी नज़र आती है क्योंकि आज के मजलिस में हमने मबदत आल मोहम्मद का जिक्र किया है 
مودت عال محمد کا تقاضا یہ ہوتا ہے کہ ہم اپنے زندگی کے معاملات میں جب بھی ڈسیشن لینا ہو سب سے پہلے دماغ میں قرآن اور سیرت معصومین آنے چاہیے اگر یہ کیفیت نہیں ہے تو اس کا مطلب یہ کہ ہمارے مود مودت جذبے مودت عال محمد میں ضعف اور کمی ہے آپ اصحاب امام حسین میں جناب مسلم بن اوسجا کو دیکھ لیں جو پہلا حملہ ہوا ہے جس میں جسے تاریخ میں حملے اولا کہتے ہیں عاشور کے دن جہاں دست جمی حملہ ہوا کیولری فورس نے چار ہزار کے گھوڑے سوار دستے نے ایک ساتھ اٹیک کیا تھا ان کا پلان یہ تھا کہ سپیڈ کے ساتھ آئیں گے اور حسین کے لشکر کو ٹرمپل کر کے ختم کر دیں گے یہ انفرادی جو جنگ ہو رہی تھی خام خواہ اس میں وقت برباد ہو رہا ہے امام کو احساس ہو گیا ان کا عزم کیا ہے امام نے جس طرح سے اپنا دفاع کا انتظام کیا ہے یہ حملہ جو ہے ناکام رہا اور اس کیولری فورس کو ریٹریٹ کرنا پڑا لیکن اس کامیابی میں امام حسین علیہ السلام کے پچاس اصحاب شہید ہو گئے ہیں یہ جو آپ شہادت کے سلسلے میں ہر شہید کے ذکر کو نہیں سنتے ہیں اس لیے کہ پہلے حملے ہی میں پچاس اصحاب شہید ہو چکے تھے گرد و غبار جب بیٹھا ہے امام نے مقتل کا معائنہ کیا خبر ملی کہ مسلم بن اوسجا بھی زخمی ہو چکے ہیں اور یہ بزرگ صحابہ میں سے تھے امام کے امام جاتے ہیں قریب میں حبیب بھی ساتھ ساتھ گئے حبیب دوست تھے مسلم بن اوسجا کے دونوں کوفے کے رہنے والے ہیں ازدارن حسین اس وقت حبیب نے ایک سوال کیا ہے سوال کیا ہے جناب مسلم بن اوسجا سے کہ بھائی جس منزل پہ تم جا رہے ہو ان قریب ہم بھی تمہارے پیچھے پیچھے آئیں گے لیکن مجھے کچھ موقع ملا ہے تمہارے بعد اگر تمہاری وصیت ہو تو بیان کرو اس پر عمل کر کے ہم اجر الہی حاصل کریں گے زدانہ نے حسین اس وقت بھی اس قافلے میں ان کی ایک زوجہ اور ایک اولاد آئی تھی ساتھ تھی لیکن مسلم بن اوسجا کے دل و دماغ میں اس وقت کسی اور کا تصور نہیں تھا یہ جذبۂ مودت کی جو بات ہوتی ہے زندگی کے آخری لمحات ہیں حبیب جیسا دوست وصیت کے لیے کہہ رہا ہے لیکن مسلم بن اوسجا نے اپنی بات نہ کی ان کے ساتھ جو ان کی کنیز یا زوجہ آئیں تھیں ان کا ان کا ذکر نہ کیا نوجوان بیٹا ساتھ تھا اس کا ذکر نہیں کرتے ہیں اشارہ کرتے ہیں ابا عبد اللہ الحسین کی طرف وہ کہتے ہیں اے حبیب اسی کا بحاد حبیب اگر میری وصیت ہے تو بس ایک ہے جب تک تم زندہ ہو دیکھنا حسین کو کچھ نہ ہو آخری وقت بھی مودت اہل آل رسول کا یہ جذبہ تھا اور اسی کے بعد ان کی آنکھ بن جات بن ہو جاتی ہے ازدارانہ حسین لیکن یہ ہم آہنگی دیکھیں کہ تھوڑی دیر کے بعد ایک نوجوان بچہ آتا ہے امام کے سامنے اس کے کمر میں ایک کمر بند لگی ہوئی تھی اور اس میں ایک چھوٹی سی تلوار تھی امام اسے دیکھتے ہیں وہ آتا ہے کہ مجھے اذن جہاد چاہیے امام نے اس کے قد و قامت کو دیکھا اور پہچان گئے کہ یہ مسلم بن اوسجا کا بیٹا ہے کہا ہے کہ بیٹا ابھی تیرے بابا ابھی ابھی شہید ہوئے ہیں یقیناً ماں چاہتی ہوں گی کہ تو ان کے یاد کے طور پہ باقی اور زندہ رہو وہ بچہ کہتا ہے کہ مولا میری ماں نے یہ کمر بند باندھا ہے یہ تلوار ماں نے دی ہے اور کہا ہے کہ جاؤ حسین کے قدموں میں اپنی جان کو نثار کرو ازدارانا حسین جب یہ ہم آہنگی اس طرح کی ہونی ہوتی ہے تو وہ جذبہ مودت آل محمد اولاد میں بھی سراعت کر جاتی ہے امام نے دعا خیر کی اس ماں کے لیے 
और इसे इजाजत दे दी है लेकिन इजाजत दी है लेकिन वो नौजवान बच्चा गालिबन ग्यारह या दस साल का था किस तरह से लड़ता कितना लड़ता आखिर में एक मलून आता है उस पर वार करता है उसे शहीद कर देता है न सिर्फ ये कि शहीद करता है देखता है कि माँ अपने खैमे के पर्दे को खोल के बेटे की शहादत को देख रहा है उस मलून के दिल में जो जो सख्ती थी वो बच्चे के सर को तन से जुदा करता है और फेंकता है माँ के कदमों की तरफ माँ ने उस बच्चे के सर को उठाया बोसा देने के बाद मख्तल की तरफ फेंक देती है ये कहते हुए कि जो हमने अल्लाह के राह में दे दिया है हम उसे वापस नहीं लेते हैं अजदारा ने हुसैन यही जज्बा हम जनाब मुस्लिम बिन अकील और उनकी जो में देखते हैं और इस उनके साथ भी जो जुल्म हुआ है उनके दो फर्जन थे जो बाद में असीर हुए इसी वाकयात करबला में और इनकी शहादत तकरीबन 11 महीने के बाद हुई है कोफे में अजदारा ने हुसैन वहाँ पर सिर्फ एक बात हम कहना चाहेंगे कि अहल हरम में जितनी खातन जिनके बच्चे इतने जवान थे कि वो जहाद के लिए जा सके वो सब शहीद हो चुके थे एक लिहाज से हर माँ ने इस चैप्टर को एक क्लोजर दिया हुआ था उन्हें मालूम था कि मेरी औलाद शहीद हो चुकी है लेकिन मुस्लिम की सोजा वो कोफा से वो करबला से कोफा गई लेकिन दोनों बेटे तो वहाँ भी न मिले शाम भी जाती हैं और फिर वापस करबला होते हुए मदीना जाती हैं एक साल तक इस माँ को खबर नहीं थी कि मेरे बेटे मोहम्मद इब्राहिम दुनिया में जिंदा है या नहीं है आखिर में खबर मिली कि उनको शर्फ कोफा में नहर के करीब उन्हें भी शहीद कर दिया गया है मातम हुसैन